Hey everybody, we just completed another shiur as part of the Jewish ideology, Jewish Ashkafa series by the Chazonish. And this one is a special shiur for leaders, for rabbis, for people that are leading their family, their community. Does the leader need tzchiduk? Does the leader need musar? What if the leader is, has got a big ego? What if the leader knows a lot? What if he's a really big talmid chacham? Does anybody need to remind him that maybe he's wrong? Does anybody need to remind him of anything that perhaps he doesn't know? Questions like this are in a lot of people's minds, but same token, very few people have the courage to speak. Here comes the Chazonish with some truth that I think will help every single household and certainly every community that has a leader with courage to listen to the truth. Enjoy. everybody. We're going to continue our series and start off a new week with a uh, extraordinary divrei Torah from the Chazonish on our series of the Jewish Ashkafa, the Jewish ideology, trying to get a better idea of how to think like Jews, how to think like the Torah does. And uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, tonight she was a uh, very unique in, in a sense that the uh, Chazonish addresses an issue that's usually not uh, addressed at least not in a public forum. Uh, but tonight we're going to try to use the uh, the Divrega uh, Kutsho, the, the holiness of the Chazonish, to give ourselves some chizut, Chizuk and anybody else that's watching it, whether they're a rabbi or a Talmud or a friend or even a foe. Uh, this is uh, certainly Divrei Torah that uh, shouldn't be missed. Tonight's shiur will be for the uh, Refuah Shlema, for uh, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, of Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Levana, Bat Sara, uh, Talia, Bat uh, Sara, um, Avi Mori, David ben Nasriya, Imi Morati, Doris, Bat Jora, and uh, also all of Am Yisrael, for all the righteous Noahais that continue to uh, support us, continue to help us in, uh, by donating money, donating time, skills, and everything else that uh, is possible to help the organization. If anyone that wants to donate can go to the uh, Be'ezrat Hashem website, either bhtorah.org or be'ezrathashem.org. And the uh, many other opportunities out there to join us, whether it's the Kolo in Israel or uh, some of the other wonderful things that we have in the organization. Also, as a side note, for anybody that wants to do some ki local kiruv, especially right now during the time of Shovavim. Shovavim is an auspicious time to do tshuva uh, for Tikkun Abrit. Uh, and everyone that knows, uh, we have a uh, campaign, tikkunabrit.live. Anyone that wants to do a tikkun uh, or two or more or a hundred tikkunim for any morality sins they've made in the past, this is certainly the time to do so. But in addition to that, you can go to the Kiruv store that we have, kiruvstore.org, and get yourself some of these tikkunabrit cards. These cards, Baruch Hashem, we just got a new shipment. And uh, you can get some of them to give out in your local community, give out 50, 100, 500, whatever it is. Uh, you can get a bunch of them at the Kiruv store and uh, give them out in your community. Give them out uh, either uh, hand, uh, hand them one at a time to people or you could just take, you know, 10, 15 at a time and put it on the uh, shelf at different stores, Judaica stores, the kosher stores, the synagogue. Only thing I wouldn't recommend is to take a stack of 50 or 100 and just drop them off in one place because that will end them up in the garbage. The best is to simply give them out to people in their hand or like one of my uh, Talmudim is doing in Eretz Yisrael. They're literally putting it in envelopes in people's mailboxes. And Baruch Hashem, they're getting much better results. Other people are using different strategies, but I know the one strategy that never works is if you simply take too many of them and just put them on a shelf hoping for the best. That never works. So, you can get these for free. This is what we use the money for uh, in the Tikkun Abrit campaign. This and many other things to publicize the movie, to publicize the teachings of Tikkun Abrit. This is something you can use uh, in your community here in the, in the States. If you're located outside of the States, if you're located outside of the United States, then we're happy to give you the cards for free, but you'll have to pay for shipping. And I have to warn you, shipping outside of the U.S. has gotten much more expensive than any other time, and in some places, it simply just doesn't make sense to do it. 
uh, like if you're in India or you're in Africa or anything like that, I simply just wouldn't recommend it. I could send you the digital copy of the cards. You can print them on your own over there because it's just simply uh, cost inhibitive to, uh, to send them out over there. It costs uh, you know, more money uh, to ship them than the cards are actually worth. But certainly it's something that's worth everybody's attention, these Kiruv cards. Baruch Hashem. So with that being said, we have uh, uh, in front of us a very unique shiur uh, answering the uh, the question that perhaps has uh, crossed our minds, crossed your minds in the past, uh, or not. But do rabbis need chizuk? Do the religious leaders, the speakers that you see on YouTube and Torah Anytime and all of the other websites out there that publicize Torah, do they themselves need chizuk? Uh, do they themselves need some musar? And in fact, the chazunish, uh, is going to go into that with a uh, huge banner saying absolutely yes, they do need it. And uh, he'll actually go into uh, into the details of not only why they need it, but uh, in fact why it's paramount for them to, to uh, use this Musar even more than the average person does. Because the, uh, the deen uh, on, the, uh, on the people that are leading the communities is much more specific than it is on the community members this does not absolve the community members from any sins that they do but uh the reality is anyone that has been given uh a platform by a kadosh Baruch Hu to speak to the public whether it's through your tens of thousands of subscribers on youtube or different websites or it's in your community that you have members there or even if it's your literally just you and your five or six members in your family uh, anyone that's given a stage, the, they were given that stage by a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and they're going to be uh, 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 measured based on the stage that they were given. And in fact, one of the scariest stories that uh, I ever heard uh, that does not involve anything gruesome at all uh, is the story of how the Musar movement uh, by Rabbi Yisrael Misalant uh, was started. I mean, Musar has been... Uh, part of the Jewish religion since day one, one of the main foundations of Musar is Genesis, is Sefer Bereshit. We learn from the Avot. This is also called Sefer HaYesharim, the, the book of the straight, because Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov were all straight people, honest people, and we learn a lot of Musar from their behavior, such as the, uh, the uh, Avraham Avinu returning the money to the different hotels that allowed him to stay there for free after uh, you know acquiring a huge amount of wealth when he went to Paro, he still returned to the same places and returned the money to them, even though in reality he could have simply done what uh, a lot of people do today, which is avoid paying the debt under all conditions, even when you have the money. In fact, some people have gotten it so wrong that they actually borrow money with an intention of not paying back because they figure, listen, the credit card company, the banks, they have plenty. If I take an extra fifty, hundred thousand dollars from them or fifty million from them, it's no big deal. They have plenty. They'll get bailed out by the government. They may get bailed out by the government, but you're not going to get bailed out by the government, nor are you going to get bailed out by anybody else. Uh, and in fact, we'll have to return to this world again for a gilgul if you ever want to see. Uh, Gan Eden, because a person that has stolen money on their hands cannot see uh, Gan Eden. So unfortunately today when people don't know, don't know the, 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 uh, the strictness of the deen, they could literally live their entire life thinking that they're religious, thinking that they're doing the right thing, but in reality have blood on their hands. Yaakov Avinu was Kodesh Kodeshim, but one of the uh, most extraordinary things that I ever learned about Yaakov Avinu was when he told his wives that their father, Lavan, Lavan Arasha, has been uh, you know, lying to him and cheating him for 20 years. Now, of course, the daughters knew that their father was bad, but what we learned from Yaakov Avinu mentioning it is that for 20 years, Yaakov Avinu has been sitting there quietly being cheated by Lavan, their father, and he never said a single word even to his own wives just to protect his, the holiness of his speech. So needless to say, this is the greatest book of Musar that could exist. Of course, we learn an extraordinary amount of Musar from the rest of the Torah, specifically from the Sefer Dvarim, from the book of Deuteronomy. But again, the Musar movement by, that started a couple of hundred years ago by Rabbi Yisrael Misalant sanctified it uh, further, sanctified it further, making it a unique teaching 
rather than a part of the teaching. It's always been part of the Torah, but Rabbi Yisrael Misalant, he sanctified it in such a way where it became a teaching of its own, created Bate Musar, houses of Musar. And of course, anyone that uh, read about how they learned Musar in those days, they know it's very, very different than the way people learn Musar today. They would take a statement from the Mishnah, take a statement from the Gemara, take a statement from the sages, and repeat it over and over and over again for hours at a time until it was literally engraved into their neshama, engraved into their neshama, and of course, put themselves in specific tests to uh, make sure that they have enough bitachon, to put themselves in specific tests to make sure that they've instilled these teachings into their lives, hence the reason why the Baalei Musar tend to have an extraordinary amount of emunah and bitachon, much more than the other uh, parts of uh, Judaism. Of course, there's exceptions everywhere, but needless to say, the, uh, the Baalei Musa were very extraordinary people, not just in the fire and brimstone like many people foolishly think, but rather also because of how much faith in Hashem they have in bitachon and Hashem. But needless to say, the, uh, the Musa movement was not begun with such a, uh, a, a priority as far as bitachon, but rather because of a major failure in the teachings that happened to Klal Israel in a generation beforehand. That uh, with the story begins with a, um, a shoemaker, a, sh- <clears throat> a shoemaker that lived at the time of Rabbi Israel Misalant, that uh, was barely making any money, but of course, Hashem decreed that this person will become rich. This person becoming rich, there's nothing he can do about it. You can't stop the wealth if Hashem wants you to become rich, just like you can't stop the bankruptcy if Hashem wants you to become a bankrupt. Needless to say, many people that do not understand this will exert themselves with two or three jobs or overtime and not realize what the Chavot HaLevavot, Rabbeinu Bachir says nearly a thousand years ago in Sha'ar Abitachon, in the fourth chapter, where a person that exerts themselves too much at acquiring money simply doesn't understand that there is a hand that decrees everything in heaven. If you're going to be rich, it has absolutely nothing to do with your skill set, with your effort on how hard you work and what kind of customers you have and even what type of business you're in. If it was decreed for you to be successful and be wealthy, Hashem will do it. You won't have to necessarily do anything more than the average. But a person that doesn't realize it is simply fooling himself, says Rabbeinu Bachye. What is it like? And he gives an example. He says an example is that there was a person in the desert. Of course, number one asset in the desert is water. So he's looking for water, he's looking for water, and eventually he sees a little small uh, part of a uh, uh, little... Uh, pond of water but this water is filthy this water has all types of creatures in it certainly as soon as he tastes it he tastes the bitterness and the disgusting but at the same token he needs water to live so he spends hours and hours trying to filter this water and after he finally filters the water and he gets a cup and he drinks and he gets satiated he realizes i don't know when's the next time i'm gonna get water i have to get much more so I have to stop my journey right now and filter as much water as possible over the next couple of days so I can make sure that I have enough until the next journey, till the next destination. So he works tirelessly, hour after hour, hour after hour, filtering the water, filtering the water, and eventually after a few days, he got himself a whole bottle, a liter and a half, two liter bottle full of filtered water, that's uh that's edible and of course he is happy with himself now he goes back on his way in the desert and to his surprise only about a hundred yards beyond the point of where he starts he finds himself an enormous lake full of fresh sweet water here comes Obenu Bachi and says this is exactly the case a person can toil and toil and find unique customers and unique business opportunities and work overtime and kill themselves to try to make that extra buck not realizing that if it was decreed in heaven that you will be wealthy it'll come to you you don't have to kill yourself you don't have to desecrate the torah and forget about it and not learn as a result of it you could just simply believe that god will give it to you if 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 you know if it's necessary for him to give it to you because that was the decree and he's not going to give it to you regardless of what you do 
the point being is is that a person that has emunah and kadosh baruch and bitachon hashem lives their life knowing exactly what hand is feeding them knowing exactly where everything is coming from and rabbi israel misalat back to our story began the uh, musar movement after hearing about a story about a shoemaker a shoemaker that was in the area that uh, was very poor for a long time but one day he uh got some uh, something going in his company and another company picked it up and said listen we're going to market this for you and we're going to sell it and it took off and within a relatively short period of time the shoemaker became extraordinarily wealthy very very wealthy and the only problem that he had left is that the wealthy community did not want him why he wasn't from the elite he wasn't someone that came from a family of wealthy and they weren't exactly happy about the fact that this new money as what they call it was uh was uh, you know rubbing elbows with them all of a sudden he has a carriage with six horses all of a sudden he's building himself a huge villa all of a sudden he has all this new property they weren't happy about it and they planned on making fun of him but making fun of him with style making fun of him in such a fashion that he'll re- always be reminded of where he came from now where did they decide to do this at the wedding of his child now he wanted to make sure that this wedding is going to be a memorable wedding so he invited all of the elite all of the wealthy people and he spent an enormous amount of money to make sure that every little luxury that could possibly exist and available to him is what's going to be available at this wedding and of course inviting everyone showing them that he you know he belongs he belongs among the elite he belongs among the wealthy only to hear somebody calling out his name in front of all the wealthy people in the middle of the wedding and as he turns around happy one of the people has a shoe in the air it says hey uh, how much is it gonna cost to fix this heel you see it has a little scratch on it over here how much gonna cost how, how much are you gonna charge me to fix this heel the shoemaker was so embarrassed he fainted he fainted when Rabbi Israel Misalant heard this story he said the scariest statement I personally have ever heard he said right now in Shemaim the Bet Din of Heaven is taking out all of the religious leaders all of the rabbis the Gdole Ado from the previous generation He's taking them out of heaven and putting them in punishment in Ganom for not teaching the generation Musar to the point where you have an entire generation that thinks it's perfectly fine to publicly embarrass their fellow Jew. Something that the previous generations knew that this is you're better off to die than to do such a thing. We learned this from Tamar in the book of Genesis, Sefer Bereshit. Tamar was w- willing to jump into the fire rather than to cause embarrassment to Yehuda. But we have an entire generation that thinks it's okay to publicly embarrass their fellow Jew. The entire uh, uh, leadership of the previous generation that didn't teach Musar is going to get punished for it. And from now on, we're going to start focusing on teaching Musar. And that's how the Musar movement began. So, of course, the leaders have always needed to teach musar throughout all of the generations unfortunately in in recent years this has been something that uh, has been lacking but needless to say over the last few years we have actually seen some improvement in the world where you see certain uh, people also starting to teach musar but the question always remains does the rabbi himself the speakers the leaders do they need musar now of course anyone that's watching this if you're a rabbi if you're a speaker whatever you are certainly you can benefit from it but even if you're an average jew you're an average person out there you too could also benefit from it and you simply apply it to you personally as a leader if you're a leader of your family you're a leader of your community there are many people that tell me that they're leaders of different communities around the world either communities of jews or communities of people that want to be jews or communities of noahides 
And Baruch Hashem, there are a lot of people that are leading a community, some more, some less. Just a few days ago, I had a person that was leading a community of about two or 300 people in Pakistan. They all want to convert. There's not much we can do for them because it's an enemy country and you can't really travel over there if you're a Jew. But needless to say, they all mean they, they, uh, well when they're saying they want to convert, they want to learn Torah, they want to do the right thing. But unfortunately, they have to wait for the gates of heaven to open for them. Needless to say, they need the teachings, we need the teachings, everybody needs the teachings. For the very same reason as why this entire community at the time of Rabbi Yisrael Misalat needed the teachings. And the Chazonish says the following after teaching us last week that a person could learn Torah, learn Musar, learn a lot of good things, grow little by little, but eventually get to a point where He's coasting, or she's coasting, and thinks that they simply know enough. And they start, after doing tshuva, they've already been watching shuim for a few years. After doing tshuva, they've already been uh, following mitzvot, observing things for several years, or they were born from, they went to yeshiva. They figured that from here on now, I could just maintain. I don't need to be fanatic and just keep growing and growing. I could just maintain and be okay. And their uh, inclination leads them astray. Their inclination leads them to run away from the very same source that helped them grow in the first place many times. And they refrain from seeking out a rabbi to consult, to consult with. And part of the reason is because the same traits that were developed and strengthened the traits of confidence, the uh, the trait, the, the the part that they actually have as far as acquiring knowledge, that part is now working against them. Why? They have too much confidence to the point where they become egotistical, too much pride to the point where they feel like they have something to protect. They have to protect their image, or simply they think that they've outgrown their teachings and they could just simply do just as well or better on their own. Needless to say, a person that reads the Rambam's commentary on Pirkei Avot, when, he, uh, when it go, comes to the Mishnah, that uh, in, in Perik Aleph, where it talks about uh, make yourself a, uh, a, a rabbi, acquire yourself a friend, is the Rambam's commentary on make yourself a rabbi, he says that make yourself a rabbi even if he's not fit to be your rabbi because he doesn't know that much more than you or even more than you and in fact even if he knows less than you make him a rabbi anyway why so at the very least you have somebody to bounce off of the the ideas off of to see if you're even right to see if you if someone's going to cause you to question yourself make somebody your rabbi now of course a person is going to automatically say oh you know what i'll make uh i'll make my three-year-old son my rabbi i'll make my illiterate neighbor my rabbi now if you have a learned person, a real rabbi, a real Talmud Chacham that's accessible to you, but yet you choose otherwise, that's obviously a mistake, needless to say, uh, not going the way of what the Chachamim are saying. But one of the things that uh, it stops a person from growing is exactly what the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot in uh, chapter 4 says in the name of Rabbi Lazar Kapal that Akinah v'atava v'akavod motzin et ha'adam in ha'olam says the Mishnah that envy, desire, and honor drive a man from this world. Why envy, desire, and honor driving a man from this world? Now, when the Chazonish was telling us that we have to be very meticulous and precise about the observance of the law, this is one of the places we could actually see this in real life before we get into the details of the Musar for speakers, we first have to understand how even a speaker, a rabbi, a veteran, someone that's been learning for a long time, that is not particular about themselves as they are about teaching others, could easily fall prey even to their own to their own teachings. To the you know, and one of the places that sometimes you see that a person sees another person succeed, person sees another person uh, prevail, and Instead of being happy for them, it actually makes them upset. They become jealous, envious. Just uh, today, somebody told me that uh, they uh, rented a car 
and uh, they, uh, you know, they don't have a car. They rented a car for, you know, for a week or so, and only to find out that, uh, you know, their neighbor apparently was so upset about them renting a uh, brand new car that they decided to break their windshield wipers. Now, why would anybody do such a thing? Simply, envy. They figured, oh, what? He bought a brand new car. He's a multimillionaire. He's this, he's that, and we barely have this. We barely have that. I'm going to hurt him. And this, unfortunately, is how envy takes a person out of the world. Why? First, they committed a sin. They, they damaged somebody else's property. Now, of course, when this person is asked at some point, hey, you see, such and such, his windshield wiper is broke. You know who did it? They're going to say no. Obviously, they're not going to admit that they did it. They're going to say no. So now they made another sin. Now they're lying. Now, on top of that, they are going to continue thinking, you know, that this is okay. Why? Because the Gemara in Masechet Yoma says, when a person makes a sin and nothing happens, he does it again. If he does it again and nothing happens, it turns into permissible. So now this is a person, how a person literally from envy can turn into something horrific. Even worse... This type of lie, this type of jealousy can lead to lies, but also this type of jealousy can lead to ni'uf, to a person committing adultery. How? One of the Ten Commandments is to not commit adultery, not to, uh, uh, be, uh, uh, not to covet somebody else's wife. And a person that is jealous of somebody's wife because she's prettier than his wife or he has a wife and, he, and the other guy doesn't have a wife or whatever the case may be, that again comes stems from the same same flaw. Same flaw that his, belong, his, his blessing belongs to me. His blessing should have come to me. Why did he get it and I didn't get it? Why does she have it and I don't have it? This is the type of flawed mentality that unfortunately many, many people have that don't realize that this type of mentality is the number one destroyer of your current life. Now the Mishnah here is referring to a person losing their world as far as losing their eternity. They're going to go to, they're going to, go to Gehenom for these types of sins. Why? Because the envy, the desire, the honor are the types of things that make a person make all of the worst sins in the Torah which eventually lead them to Gehenom. And not just the little uh, washing machine genom, but the genom that is the real genom that literally has a section in it that doesn't end. Just like the Mishnah in uh, Masech Davot actually begins. It begins the Mishnah where it talks about uh, in the uh, first uh, Perek, uh, uh, Yossi ben Yochanan, Ish Yerushalayim says that uh, a person uh, has to be very careful with his speech. Uh, careful with specific things, even careful with speaking to his own wife and not speaking to her too much. Why? Because if you're not careful, so for your wish, Gehenom. Already in the first chapter of Pekavot, it already talks about Gehenom, already talks about punishment, because this, again, is one of the fundamental teachings of Judaism. And if a person doesn't understand that there are severe consequences, then there's nothing that's going to stop them from doing the most severe things. But even the traditional day-to-day things can lead a person to the worst places, things like envy, desire, and honor. We see that envy can lead to horrible things, but also desire, desiring somebody else's stuff, desiring somebody else's wife, somebody else's husband. Many people don't realize that the laws of Yichud, the laws between, you know, the, of, of making sure that there is separation between uh, you and the opposite gender, in today's world, it may actually have to, uh, the sages may have to add to it where you actually have to uh, be careful even same gender with some people. And I think that there are some schemes to talk about it already from 800 years ago, that if a person has same-sex attraction, they also have to include this for themselves, but it's not for the general public because they have a desire for the same gender. So they cannot be alone with the same gender. Needless to say, these types of things are for your own protection. You're not, uh, you're not supposed to be alone with the opposite gender, whether it's at work or it's at the, uh, uh, anywhere else, uh, specifically for your own protection because that person is somebody else's husband. That person is somebody else's wife. So that, that act going too far is not just a simple innocent sin. It can get really, really bad. And unfortunately today, there are so many people that we hear from that are not careful that uh, by the time they realize they went too far, they went too far. So needless to say, this type of uh, 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 lack of care can lead a person to go to an eternity of punishment. But not only that, 
even a life, a life full of punishment, a life full of regret, a person simply waking up one day and they're pregnant with a child of somebody that they don't necessarily want to spend any more time with. And this is, of course, a problem that happens way too often. This too is a one of the things that hurts people's lives. Last but not least, a person that's chasing honor. One of the main things that the Chazonish talks about tonight in the uh, in this particular section, the fourth chapter, the tenth section of the fourth chapter of the Sefer Emunah Bitachon. One of the main problems is a person that is very very particular about preserving his or her own honor. Uh, their own pride is being the primary reason of why they decide to do or not to do certain things. We saw that Korach, Korach in Parashat Korach, was a Navi. He was a prophet. He was a holy person at one point, but became a Rasha Merusha that went against Moshe Rabbeinu and is in Genom f- until now, 3,334 years later. One of the main proofs of how Genom is only one, not one year is Korach himself, because the Torah says that he's in Genom until this day. So the point being is, is that we see the sages make these simple statements, but when we delve into them, we realize that these statements have a lot of weight. So now the Chazonish is telling us that a person can grow in Torah, learn, finish the Shas, even become a teacher, make some videos, get a following, and go off the derech without even realizing that he's off the derech or sometimes she's off the derech. She can become a rabbitson, she can start teaching people, she can start making videos, writing articles, writing books, all in the meantime not realizing they're actually off the derech. They do not have the same ashkafa that they used to, or needless to say, they are a bad ashkafa. They have the bad ideology, an ideology of sin. And many times they don't even realize it because they do not follow their own teachings. So the Chazonish continues today and he says, the lack of seriousness in relation to the meticulousness, to the meticulous observance of mitzvot, which is declared to be a cause for the lack of development of one's character traits in general, causes even more damage if it exists in a man who prides himself in fear of heaven. Here we see the Chazonish taking a turn in a different direction where he's telling us all till now we talked about everyone the leaders the followers the the the, the scholars the the average person everywhere we talked that everything that we've learned until now is relevant to everyone but now we're t- going into a little bit of a turn to let you know that this specific teachings is particular particular of of, of particular importance for those people that claim to have fear of heaven those people that claim to have the basic foundations of belief in hashem as david melech says many times the the beginning of wisdom is the fear of hashem so we know that the uh, anyone that is a torah observant jew must have fear of heaven so chazoni says this lack of, of, of uh, meticulous observance of the mitzvot, which is the main tool that will help a person fix their character flaws, we already know this is true because we've had the last few lectures to teach us this. You have to be meticulous on the mitzvot, not only because it helps you serve Hashem, but also it helps you fix yourself, fix your anger, fix your uh, uh, lack of patience, fix this, fix that, all of the different things. But he says, if a person doesn't fix them, we learned last week, if he doesn't fix the, if he does, he's not meticular, meticulous on the, uh, on the laws, then he's also not going to be meticulous on fixing himself or fixing herself. So one causes more damage to the other. Now he says the most amount of damage happens to the one that is not meticulous on the laws and yet they claim to have fear of heaven. And in fact, even take pride in it. What does it mean they take pride in it? He spends his time preaching to others about Musar, about morals and connection and correction of traits. While only on rare occasions does he go to a sage to ask something regarding the observance of a mitzvah or the avoidance of a transgression. See here he's talking about specifically 
someone that is a public speaker a rabbi a leader that not only is someone that is just has the rabbinical uh, 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 title but really works for uh, some electric company really works uh, you know and for for some uh, local store no this is a person that spends his time teaching other people musar teaching other people character development teaching other people that they need to become better and in fact teaching them in such a fashion where it says look the, the fear of heaven that's Hashem's treasure in so many words telling them exactly what Torah says but not applying it to himself not applying it to himself how is he not applying it to himself because he himself only on rare occasions does he go to a sage and ask something regarding observance of mitzvah or avoidance of a transgression meaning for him to go to a chacham to a sage to a chacham is not going to be something that he does on a regular basis but he goes because he's torah observant and once in a while he wants to keep in touch and that's in essence the reason why he's in why, why he asked the question so the chacham does what he does learns torah does what he has to helps whoever wants to be helped and all of a sudden he gets a message he gets a phone call he gets a you know a surprise uh, visit from somebody that used to come all the time used to attend all the shiurim used to make phone calls used to make messages used to say shabbat shalom used to be constantly in touch but he hasn't heard from him in months maybe even longer and all of a sudden oh what do i owe uh, this uh, phone call for what, what how are you doing oh no good good Baruch Hashem, just been busy you know i've been busy but i wanted to ask i wanted to ask kvoda rav i wanted to ask for the rav if uh you could help me listen there is a custom uh based on parashat beshalach that uh you know you're allowed to throw some uh uh food for the birds on shabbat because that's a uh, one of the customs i'm just want to make sure is this allowed or is this a flawed custom now the chacham is going to tell hafetz chaim says this is not a good custom Ravadia was more lenient and said in this particular case you're allowed to follow this custom because it's been already around for many many centuries needless to say this question is a fake question why where were you over the last six months where were you over the last six years where were you over all this time how did you i mean obviously you know that there are many more laws in the torah many more mitzvot in the torah many more particular things that affect everybody's day-to-day life who did you go to all this time how did you figure out what to do when you signed the deal for a million dollars how did you decide what to do when you fired that employee or hired the other one how did you decide what to do when you had a lawsuit that you wanted to sue someone or someone sued you how did you decide what to do when you weren't really sure if what you just did on shabbat or wanted to do on shabbat was allowed or not allowed how did you survive for the last six months or six years without getting in touch with the chacham how did you do that ah oh no no i i i knew oh you knew you knew you knew you why so everything you knew and this you didn't know everything else you knew and this you didn't know maybe i should come to you maybe you'll be my chacham and that's the reality many times you see people stay in touch with the chacham how they stay in touch with the chacham once in a blue moon they're either too lazy to go on google to find out or they simply want to stay in touch so they send some meaningless question not because the question is meaningless but to them it really doesn't have any significance and say hey listen rabbi uh this uh new product they have uh on this uh site it says that you're allowed to uh you know move this thing and it shuts the light but without shutting the light just covers the light is that allowed not allowed wait i haven't heard from you in a year and a half how did you how did you do everything until now this is the first question you have in a year and a half I don't know every single day goes by I have 500 questions how do you only have one question every year and a half are you that much of a genius 
Are you, I mean, do you know everything? Or perhaps you have somebody else. If you have somebody else, why didn't you take this question to him too? If you don't have somebody else, what made you remember me today? And the reality is, is that many times it's the ego that keeps people away from going to the Chachamim with the real questions. They just sign a deal for a million dollars. They don't need advice from the Chacham. They just made a partnership for five million. They don't need any ideas from the Chacham. Are you allowed? Not allowed? Is there issues of Ribit here? Is there issues of Gezel? Is there issues of this? Issues of that? No, no, I know business. Well, you may know business, but you may not know Allah pertaining to business. They just bought a house, sold the house, got married, divorced, kids, this, that, ch- changed the school for the kids. Any of those big, huge questions, monumental questions, they figure on their own. But an hour and a half before Shabbat, suddenly they have a question about a custom. Where were you over all these months? How did you survive? i tell you how you survived. The ego told you that you can do it on your own. You could just open up a book and figure it out on your own. And better yet, you know what? I think I read this before. I don't even need to open the book. I remember. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. What do you mean it's okay? You sure it's okay? Because I remember reading somewhere else. Not okay. No, no, trust me. It's okay. And they figured that they their logic makes it okay. Their logic allows it to be okay. And unfortunately, Rabotai Karim, this is all too common among everyone not just uh, uh uh the average person including people that are rabbis including people that are famous speakers many times anyone that delves into some of the stories either the ones that we've uh, brought out and exposed or the stories that have been exposed in the past of different so-called rabbis that went completely off the one common denominator you will see is that they do not have a solid relationship with a rabbi either because they don't have a rabbi their rabbi died or their rabbi simply is uh, not uh, they're not communicating to him or they simply just don't tell tell the rabbi the truth they tell the rabbi what they want him to hear many times you see this common denominator where they don't have anybody to answer to they decided they answered to themselves and this is one of the biggest satans that a person can have in their life because a person can think that they know just enough to live on their own without asking the big questions and unfortunately this is something that happens and it causes a lot of damage even in the rabbinical world why because the person that has learned went to yeshiva went to kolel went to the books learned for many years gave a lot of speeches became successful has a following has a synagogue or two has uh, all types of campaigns he figures i made it now of course he knows he cannot learn anywhere near as much today now that he has this big following and success as he did in the past but needless to say his success makes him believe that even maintaining it is fine yeah but what about the big questions listen i know enough from my experience that it's okay and he gives himself the pass the students no pass you guys have to ask me every time you have something you have to ask your rabbi but for himself he'll even invite a missionary and say listen it's okay it's okay i know it's okay how do you know it's okay because it's okay if it wasn't okay somebody will tell me but there's a bunch of people telling you no 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 they're not really big rabbis they're not telling me i'll do all types of awful things and figure that it makes sense to him why because he's been a rabbi for so many years it must be okay it must be okay but what about the contact that he has with different chachamim you'll notice that it's only on occasion only on occasion he'll invite him over only on occasion he'll make the phone call not on a regular basis why not on a regular basis because he's too busy he's too busy being a speaker he's too busy being a rabbi he's too busy with a lot of things busy or no busy but there must be a lot of questions there must be a lot of big questions a lot of sensitive issues 
So how do you deal with that? I mean, you tell your students that they have to come to you or come to a bedin or come to somebody to, to ask these big questions. What about you? Says the Chazonish, he does not subject himself to the necessity of doing everything exactly according to the law, for he is afraid of losing his beloved rabbinical position. Usually such a person has not worked on understanding the inquiries of Abaya and Rava in the Gemara, has not exerted himself in learning Allah, and as such has not acquired this knowledge. If he hasn't labored over the Torah and has not trained himself to observe mitzvot meticulously, then his character traits have not been tested, nor have they been corrected. So here we see that whether it's an online rabbi, a community rabbi, or a family and friend rabbi, meaning a person that's leading his own family or friends and is trying to give them chizuk, a person can literally fool themselves into thinking that they know just enough and tell everybody that if you have a question, come to me. Don't ever trust your own opinion. Make sure to learn more. Make sure to do more. But they themselves don't do it. In fact, they busy themselves with helping people they busy themselves with their rabbinical position which they love their leadership position which they love which means that they don't have as much time to learn the gemara to learn the post scheme to acquire the knowledge of the real chachamim and if they have not toiled over the torah and have not trained themselves to be meticulous with the mitzvot that means that they're also not meticulous with their character traits which means that they could be practicing envy on a regular basis without even noticing it they could be a prideful person in the eyes of everyone that has eyes except their own they could be lusting for things that are forbidden or lusting for things that are permitted but too much without even realizing that lust is even part of their life why since they are not particular about the mitzvot to the point where they're meticulous about them needless to say their character traits as the chazuni says are also not being tested and also not being corrected since the meticulousness of the mitzvot is the number one tool that helps correct the actual character traits now according to his natural tendencies the rabbinate and the pseudo honor are foundations of his life and the essence of his aspirations he recoils from the slightest infringement on his honor and without his intending it a way of thinking develops within him that does not much respect Allah that part of the Torah that he lacks here the chazonish really really gives it the chazonish is very particular about the words that he uses of course i'm reading the translation the hebrew version is right next to it and he says it the same exact thing in this case where in hebrew it's easier to understand it quite frankly but needless to say here the chazonish is is telling us that this person that has this leadership position let's call it rabbinical position this position is everything to him it defines him as a character defines him as a person he wakes up a rabbi he goes to sleep a rabbi he talks to people rabbi he writes rabbi he introduces rabbi he says goodbye rabbi he dreams rabbi he's always rabbi same thing for females for for the women rebbitson and so on the rabbi is a position that's beloved by him that is him that is her they like it and they think they're really good at it and perhaps they are except when it comes to themselves and what ends up happening is that since the rabbinical position has become they're such so beloved by them so important to them they become scared of asking the real chachamim the ones that toil in torah may not even be big rabbis that are you know have a community but they're real serious torah scholars 
They don't go to their rabbi and ask him the questions. Why? Because they figure that, wait a minute, if I ask the rabbi, am I allowed to do such and such before the event, he may say no. Then I have to cancel the event. If I cancel the event, I'm going to look bad in front of my community. And that's going to be a chilul Hashem. So certainly, I, the experience I have is going to be enough and it's it's better to just simply rely on my experience and my, the basic knowledge that I have than to cause desecration of Hashem's name. Meaning his own logic can mislead him in such a fashion where he won't ask specific questions because of his position, because of her position. And this can even you know be relevant to somebody in their own house. A man is leading his family. And there's a, there's a dispute. The wife doesn't agree with the husband. And they make the mistake of having this disagreement in front of the kids, in front of the uh, uh, you know, relatives, in front of the uh, whoever's there on the uh, table. And she says, this is, I think, uh, honey, I love you and everything, but I think you're incorrect about this one because I heard it in a shiur by rabbi and such and such, and he can't stand it when she hears a shiur by anybody other than him. He can't stand it that she hears of anybody other than him. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm your rabbi. I'm your Moshe Rabbeinu. I'm your Aaron Cohen. I'm your everything. That's, you know, every husband, you know, that uh, is a little delusional can get that far. And unfortunately, Am Yisrael got that far. The Gemara in Masechet Megillah says, why did, uh, you know, Am Yisrael accuse, accuse Moshe Rabbeinu of, uh, of adultery? I mean, he left his own wife. Hashem told him to leave his own wife because he wanted to be in a state of purity at all times. How can you accuse him of, of adultery out of all things in the world? The, the men accused him of adultery, not because they actually thought that he's with their wives, but rather because they couldn't understand how come their wives are listening to Moshe Rabbeinu, but not to them. How so? When they asked their wives, give us your jewelry, give us your gold so we can put, make a golden calf. The wife said, no, I'm not giving you the gold. I'm not giving you my jewelry. The women didn't sin here. But when Moshe Rabbeinu said, give me the gold, give me the uh, whatever you want to put to build the Mishkan, all the women were in a hurry to give it to Moshe Rabbeinu. So the husband said, wait a minute. Moshe Rabbeinu asked for the gold. You give it to him right away. I ask you as your husband, you don't even give it to me. Ah, there must be something between you. What, something between Moshe Rabbeinu and 600,000 women? In their mind, it didn't make a difference. I don't like it that you hear the rabbi. I don't like it that you listen to anybody but, my, but me. And this is a very serious problem when the, when the uh, husband either has a different rabbi than the wife or worse yet, when he thinks he's supposed to be the rabbi. This is one of the biggest poisons in, all, in families. Now, you have a situation where a guy says something and his wife heard differently he cannot tolerate the fact that she said anything different than him needless to say in front of the kids needless to say in front of company needless to say out loud how could how dare you go against me i learn in a kolel i learn in the bet midrash i learn at six o'clock in the morning who do you think wow well, you think you're going against da, da, da. they don't like it they don't like it now it does happen that once in a while the wife is right sometimes it happens more than once in a while she's right now the husband he doesn't want to find out if she's right why the secret is so long as it's just a debate in the air we don't confirm nothing in the eyes of everybody else it's 50 50. maybe i'm right maybe she's right but if i go call the rabbi and say listen rabbi Listen, my, you know, my cute wife, she's a little silly sometimes. She said that you're not allowed to such and such. But I told her it's ridiculous. Right, Rabbi? And if the Rabbi says, uh, no, actually, uh, he doesn't want to hear the rest of the answer. I doesn't want to hear the answer. Oh, this connection. Is, I, I can't hear you. This, what? What? what this, this, this reception. Reception. doesn't want to hear it. Why? So long as it's not confirmed she's right. My rabbinical position is intact. My leadership position is intact. But today, with technology at your fingertips, needless to say, many books, Baruch Hashem, at your fingertips, you can find out the answers. 
so you can address these issues but you still don't have a solution for the flawed character trait that sometimes the leader of the family or needless to say the leader of a community can have when they're shown hey listen you said it's allowed to bring a missionary to a synagogue but the bed dean here in the uh in israel said not allowed the bed dean in lakewood said not allowed the bed dean in yerushalayim said not allowed in fact we haven't found one rabbi aside from you and your friends that says it's allowed can you show us anybody that says it's allowed oh you know listen it's behind us you don't understand it's something else it's something this wait so you're telling me that you're not going to face the facts that you made a mistake and you're going to stop doing it no why so long as this issue is unanswered publicly and i don't have to face the music of publicly admitting i was wrong my thousands of followers will simply look at me as a victim my thousands of followers will simply look at me as a wise man that has people chase him just like moshe rabbeinu did but in reality you know you're living a lie in reality you know you're telling people lies but your rabbinical position is so dear to you You simply cannot face it this affects people from all walks of lives whether it is a rabbi of a huge community or it's a rabbi of a small little community a rabbi of an entire country like England perhaps or a rabbi in a little tiny town that no one ever heard of and in fact even a small little family with couple of kids the person that leads the family is like the family's rabbi even there these type of problems exist and this type of ego exists and destroys everything in sight why because people hold their rabbinical position or pseudo honor as the chazonish calls it as the foundation to their life and recoil at the slightest infringement to their honor what about the fact that i just proved you wrong what about the fact that your wife just showed you that it's incorrect what do you do then says the chazonish that this ego this chasing of honor leads a person to such a behavior where it develops to a point where they start disrespecting the parts of Allah that they don't know meaning that you show them listen you know the uh al Shabbat yeah yeah al Shabbat I'm good yeah al Shabbat you're good but the, the the laws of of like business you know the Baba Metzia Baba Kama Baba Batra Choshe Mishpat all that parts you're not so uh expertise there you know Shabbat you're good you know the al of Shabbat psh, but business not so good so perhaps maybe uh you could get some continuing education maybe you need to learn a little bit more on it now nah, listen people don't ask the questions anyway about business and i know just enough i've done enough business i know enough i don't need to ask it's okay it's okay they minimize they minimize that maybe perhaps what they don't know is important or the opposite somebody asks him listen you an expert an expert in regards to Ilchot Shabbat expert in regards to business but when it comes to the family purity I mean you said in your shiur she has to wait five days but you didn't take into account that she may be a Sephardi and it could be four days and you didn't really explain the seven days and you also didn't explain the, the the all the details of what happens during the seven days I mean are you assuming that she knows all of that stuff or do you have like a different shear that you gave nah listen people know people know what if they don't know if they don't know they'll be fine they'll come to me and they'll minimize it and if they ask him a question about it and they make a mistake listen rabbi you 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 said that if it's that color then everything's okay but it's that color it's it's not okay come ask right but i saw in the book by Arab Mordechai Liao, or I saw in a book by Rav Ovadia, or I saw in a book by some of the other Chachamim, and 
actually, he said the exact opposite of what you did, what you said. So, did, did I not hear you right? No, no, no. It's not that you didn't hear me right. It's, it's fine, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Anything you can find, it's fine. What do you mean it's fine? I, I saw in a book, I heard in a shoe, the opposite of what you said. It's fine, don't worry. There's always different shito, different strategies, different rabbis. Don't worry, what I said to you is fine. And they'll justify their error. Why? How could I admit that I was wrong? Admitting that I'm wrong. Chas v'shalom. It's a, uh, it's rather die than not, not admit that they're wrong. And this unfortunate Rabotai is one of the horrible things that happens in the process of not admitting that a person is wrong is that they'll minimize what they don't know. They'll tell you it's not important, it's fine, it's okay, don't make a big deal out of it, people don't even talk like that anymore, people don't do that stuff anymore, it's fine, it's okay, this is just a problem for Baal Tshuva, only the Baal Tshuva think like that and do things like this, only the people that are Hasidists do that, only this, everything that they don't know, everything they're not familiar with, everything that wasn't their idea or that came out of their mouth is less, is minimized. And this is unfortunately a behavior, the Chazuni says, is a behavior pattern that develops specifically when it comes to the area of Allah, to the laws themselves. You tell a person, listen, you're a, you're, you're a big rabbi. You have a community. You have a thousand people in your community. Baruch Hashem, Hashem gave you a big stage. Now before you say thank you, I just have one question for you. You see, in the Shulchan Aruch, the Kitsu Shulchan Aruch, the Rambam, the Gemara, Chasidut, Zohar, and anywhere else you want to find it, they all say that you're not allowed to show public affection to your own wife. Needless to say, to somebody else's wife. You have pictures of yourself online that you promoted, that you're promoting, and even if somebody else is promoting, needless to say, you have pictures online where you're showing public affection to your wife and sometimes to somebody else's wife. Can, can you explain that for me? Is that like a momentary error and you just forgot the law? Or you simply just don't really care about this law? Because it is a law. It's not a custom. You're not allowed to show public affection to your wife. Needless to say, somebody else's wife. Or a woman that, that you cannot marry because of different reasons. But you have pictures of yourself hugging different women. You have pictures of yourself close to other women. How? How do you do that? How do you justify that? Nah, come on. In the world today, people don't act like that. This is for the previous generation. And he'll minimize the law. He'll minimize the law. Make you think that you're crazy. Make you think that you're fanatic. Make you think that because he's been from his whole life and you're about Shuva, that's why you think like that. It'll make you think that because he has his own rabbis that are you're not privy to, he knows more than you. Because he's older than you, and he knows. Because of blah, 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 and blah, 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 and puka, puka, and puka, puka, and Pikachu, and pika that. That's the reason. He'll make up whatever he can just to make you think it's okay. He'll make you think it's okay. And unfortunately, Rabotai, Many people are victims to this. In the world today, they're looking for the truth. Ribono shel olam. They're looking for you. They turn on YouTube. They turn on Torah anytime. They turn on Hidabut. They turn on whatever network that has rabbis on it. But if they don't have the merit... Instead of listening to the truth, they'll listen to a liar smiling at them and pretending to tell them the truth. This Rabotai is one of the reasons 
why a person has to literally pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to receive the truth every day. Why? Because you could be learning and not even realize that what you're learning is simply incorrect. It's simply incorrect. I have people that Baruch Hashem from their whole life but are finally doing tshuva. Why? They learned wrong. Religious their whole life. They learned wrong. Not because I said it. I bring them sources. This is what Shukhan Aruch says. This is what your books say. This is what my books say. This is what it says. Oh, I never heard this before. Okay, now you heard. Baruch Hashem. Hashem loves you enough that He gave you the truth in a silver platter. Even though you're 30 now or 20 now or 50 now. But you have it. You didn't live your whole life without it. I can't believe it. How come my rabbis never told me? I have no idea why they didn't tell you. But this could be one of the reasons. Sometimes the rabbi needs chizuk. Sometimes the rabbis need chizuk to be reminded that a rabbinical position is a responsibility. It's not a job. It's not to be a cashier. It's not to be a CEO. It's taking people's lives in your hand and making sure you treat them with the utmost care like they do at a hospital with an infant. Now, a person that is not careful with their own neshama to make sure that they are double-checking everything they say, everything they understand with someone that's wiser than them, with a bigger chacham, is certainly not a person that cares enough about the public. Why? Because if you have too much confidence in yourself to think that you simply know everything and you're not going to double check with the Chacham, you're not going to double check with your Rabbi, especially when it comes to big decisions, don't ask your Rabbi, listen, when does Shabbat come in? You can find that on your own. There's something, there's different applications for that. Don't ask your Rabbi, listen, Rabbi, what parasha is it this week? You could find out on your own. Don't ask your rabbi, Rabbi, what does uh, Rashi say on this verse? You can open the Chumash and find out what the verse says. But if you're about to accept something that's life-changing, if there is a decision you need to make that is significant, then you ask your rabbi. If you're leading a community, those types of questions may end up happening every day. Not for you, but for your community. And if you take all of that on your shoulders just assuming that you're answering everything right 100 percent of the time without double checking with your rabbi you are clearly not fit to be a rabbi why because you don't care about enough about your own neshama to double check if you're wrong how could you possibly be in charge and responsible for other people's neshama and that's what the chazoni says that if you go to such people and you tell them listen what about those areas that, uh, you know, we have weakness in the community? You see there's two, three, four cars, sometimes two, three, four hundred cars in some communities that they're driving on Shabbat with no care in the world. What about doing a uh, specific shiur series of Yirat Shamaim, of Yilchot Shabbat, of not just telling them the laws of Shabbat and the laws of Muktzei and all the laws, but telling them the consequence of not following the laws because they're driving on Shabbat and not realizing that they're considered idol worshippers. Instead of giving them an aliyah, give them a ticket to come to the shiul. No, come on. We don't want to scare them away. And they'll minimize it. They mean well. They're tinokot they're captured babies. And they'll minimize it. And unfortunately, this minimization, this political correctness, is something that needs to disappear if you're going to lead people in the right direction. But we can't fix the world. We could simply just tell people what our sages said. Now, if a person has already developed this character trait and is not respecting Allah, specifically not respecting the parts that he lacks, says the Chazonish, this stops him from being devoted to a Chacham, including being one of those who constantly turns to the Chacham with questions. Now here, the Chazonish elaborates on this point by going a little deeper. 
you're asking, why don't he just call, why don't there's the rabbi, just call his rabbi, call a bigger chacham, call us serious people, not his friends, and confirm whether what he's doing is right or wrong. Confirm that whatever he said in the shield is the right thing, despite these other people calling him a heretic. Confirm that wow, the way he's leading his community is the right way, despite people saying that it's problematic. Confirm. Why don't he just make a call? What's the big deal? Chazunish says another reason. Because he doesn't res- he's already gone to the point where he doesn't respect the parts of the halacha that he doesn't know. That means that since he doesn't think it's a big deal he says it's not a big deal he starts believing it's not a big deal and therefore even if he has the opportunity to make the call and it's easy for him even if the sage is in front of him the chacham is in front of him he still won't ask him the question number one the chazoni says because he doesn't think it's a big deal and he's not devoted to this chacham so much that he asks him all the particular questions. And needless to say, says the chazonish, he doesn't want to become one of these people that constantly calls the chacham. No, come on, no, I'm going to call him every day, I'm going to call him every month, I'm going to call him every week. Why, every time somebody has a question, I have to call him? No, I'll just figure it out, don't worry. I'll be fine, God will lead me. And this is a disaster that literally grows from day to day because the questions that rabbis get today I promise you are not getting any easier there was a woman that came to us two years ago I don't know her never heard of her never saw her never met her nothing all I know is I got a question question from a woman that says she came from a religious household living somewhere in Europe. Religious household, went to seminary, kept Torah and mitzvot, everything is good. Well, although she grew up religious, she was became more and more lenient when it came to tzniut. She met a boy that also came from a religious family. In fact, he came from a rabbinical family. And he had some terrible situations happened in his life little by little he decided to not observe Torah and mitzvot and they started dating and before you know it after a very short period of time she finds out she's pregnant four months now when she found this out she wasn't exactly happy because she wasn't planning on staying with this boy and needless to say she's still young what am I going to do? Now, she didn't really want to go to the local rabbis because she didn't want the information to come out and, you know, somehow reach her family. Somehow my name come up, even though I'm a completely different country. My name came up and I got the message. What's the question? I know that we're not supposed to, you know, be have you know intimacy and so on but long story short i'm this way and i'm pregnant since i'm not planning on staying with this person can i have an abortion now of course if you go to the reform they'll tell you of course why not it's pro-choice do what you want if you go to some secular person What's the question? Now, if you go to somebody that doesn't have enough faith in Hashem and his Torah, they're also going to try to tiptoe around it. Listen, eh, eh, ooh, ah. Rabbi Hashem, for us, it wasn't much of a test. Why? We, we stick to the script. This is what it says. This is what I say. This is what Torah says. This is what I say. Of course, we try to talk to people in a, with, their, with their sensitivities and emotions in, in, in mind. We're not attacking people, telling them they're going to go to Gainom tomorrow. You know. But at the same token, 
we never forget those details we never f- let people believe that it's okay to go against the shim even if i know that right now you're gonna make a sin and there's nothing i can do about it i'm still gonna help you but i'm gonna remind you what you're doing is i'm gonna help you but what you're doing is wrong and there's never gonna be a time that i'm gonna tell you that it's right this is usually common with intermarriage people that want to convert but they're obviously already together with a uh, jew is with together with a non-jew and i know in more you know more times than not they're not going to break up so to even bother to try to convince anybody to break up is a complete waste of time especially knowing it personally how how the situation works with people's emotions and mindset and so on so you still have to help these people but you can never let them believe that what they're doing is okay in any way or they're not going to have to pay the bill for this at some point or another so of course we take all this into account i talk to this woman i tell her listen one message after another long long calls 15 minutes 20 minutes all types of things anybody that tries to get me uh, gets in touch with me knows that getting a 15 minute message with me is not a very common thing but here we saw those pikuach nefesh and Baruch Hashem, after multiple series of messages and calls and so on i told her everything i need to tell her she asked certain questions and that's it i didn't know what she's gonna do all I knew is that at least she knows the truth after that I didn't hear from her now I don't have the type of time to follow up and uh, chase people around once in a while you'll get a message how you doing or a Shabbat Shalom but generally speaking there's just too many people to follow up with everybody and before you know it two years passed a couple of days ago I got a message from this very same person asking a question but introducing herself hey by the way I'm the girl that you convince to keep the baby and I see in her profile picture it's her with a cute little two-year-old kid the baby lived now if you tiptoe around these situations if you make them feel like it's okay for a second to have an abortion they're not going to skip a beat before they go and murder that kid why they already want to do it they've already been programmed to think that it's just not a big deal it's a apala. it's like eh, not a big deal society has programmed them that murder is okay just because you don't see the body but the reality is Rabotai, if a person is not going to tell people the truth about the most difficult issues whether it's genome or the other issues before you know it they're not going to tell people the truth about even minor things this is the reason why there's so many communities that contact us and ask us questions what do i do do i continue going to the shul even though we have 15 20 30 people in a, in a, in a uh, community but we don't even have 10 of them that are observing shabbat but yet they bring out the Torah the get an Aliyah the guys are Shliach Tzibu of course you can't pray in a place like this now if a rabbi simply tells people listen you could do whatever you want but so long as you're not keeping the uh, Shabbat we cannot take out the Torah so long as you're not keeping Shabbat we can't say Kaddish so long as you're not keeping shabbat we understand you it's, it's, it's too much for you but we cannot pray as a minyan we can pray together but we can't read from the torah if the rabbi is never going to say this to his community guess what the community is never going to change but if the rabbi is accustomed himself to such a behavior where he doesn't think that what he's doing is wrong he doesn't check if his leadership and his results are up to par with a Talmud Chacham. Then he's not going to change anything. He's not going to think there's anything to change. And Chazoni says that this lack of study, this lack of study leads him to leave off proper observance of the mitzvot and the prohibitions where little by little this type of leader becomes more and more lenient 
with mitzvot, more and more lenient with prohibitions. If you notice, some of the people that began to become lenient five or ten years ago are much more lenient today. Five or ten years ago, they told you that there were certain things that are allowed on Shabbat, even though many Chachamim said not allowed. Today, they tell you everything is allowed almost. But still they call themselves Orthodox. Why? This poison pill keeps growing. It's a cancer. And this, says the Chazonish, is, there, is, is in turn circles back to increase the corruption of his traits, to widen it, which in turn decreases his attention to details. Even more so, a vicious cycle, a downward spiral. So here we see that when a leader, whether it be a big rabbi or it be a community leader or a family leader, does not allow himself to submit to a chacham, does not allow himself to become a talmid more than anything else, that is going to lead up not only to a disaster of misleading others, not only a disaster of misleading himself, but in fact it's going to lead to a deterioration of that person himself too, where they themselves will little by little become less and less meticulous about the law, more liberal about it, more liberal about the prohibitions, and also more liberal about their corruption of their own traits. Suddenly, promiscuity is not as much of a big deal. Homosexuality is no longer an abomination. Lying and cheating are not exactly the worst things in the world. They're necessary in their eyes at times. And on and on the list goes on. A downward spiral. Now, a person that thinks that this is an exaggeration has to understand that even among the wise of the goyim it's well known that knowledge is not just power but knowledge is the only thing that's going to keep you on the right path and alive one of the wise people among the nations in the uh, in europe about a hundred years ago or so said a very well-known statement that nature punishes society with death for their ignorance. Meaning that, of course, we know that Hashem runs the world. Of course, we know that Hashem is the one that decides who lives and who dies. But even among the goyim that understood, and there is wisdom among the goyim, the Gemara says, Wisdom among the goyim, if they say that there's a wise man among the goyim, believe them. There has wisdom among the goyim. If they say there's Torah among the goyim, don't believe them because there is no Torah among the goyim. Even if someone says they know the entire Chumash by heart, it doesn't mean anything. Because Torah is not just knowing the words, it's living it. So, this wise man said that nature punishes society with death. For their ignorance where a person can look at a snake and think it's beautiful think it's playful perhaps he's even thinks of messianic days where you can play with snakes and he's gonna go and grab it and that snake is gonna bite him and kill him a person is gonna think that listen the tornado is a beautiful thing to see and get really, really close, so close that he becomes a part of the tornado and his body parts become a part of the debris. So a person's ignorance can easily lead to their death. And why is nature so severe? Because that's just the way the world works. Now in the world of Torah, the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot says, Shgagat Talmud Ola Zadon. If your lack of, of, uh, of learning is the reason of why you're making sins, accidental sins, but nonetheless sins, 
those accidental sins are judged as if you did it on purpose. Why? Because you purposefully did not learn. You may not have purposefully made that particular sin, but the fact that you didn't learn, the fact that you didn't ask the Chacham, that's on purpose. Meaning that in Shemaim, they'll judge that accidental sin as an intentional sin. Same statement as these wise men among the Goim is already in our Torah. As we always say, anything good of any value is already in the Torah. Now, we always say that the Chachamim, the Tzadikim, are judged to the smallest details. One of the examples we have is in the Gemara. Masechet Sanhedrin, page 104a. We see that on the positive end, the hospitality shown by Yitro hosting Moshe Rabbeinu led him to not only feed someone and give life to someone again that ended up marrying his daughter, bringing grandkids to his life, his brother marrying his other daughter, more grandkids. But even more so, the Gemara says that Yitro's descendants became members of the Sanhedrin and sat in Lishkat Gazit, the chamber of, Hewn, of the Hewn Stone, meaning they became Gdole Ado, the grandkids of Yitro. Why? It all started with some hospitality. On the other hand, you had this guy, idol worshiper, Get to a point of a little hospitality led to his conversion, led to his daughter marrying Moshe Rabenu, led to his other daughter marrying Aaron Cohen, led to his kids becoming righteous, his descendants becoming Dole Adol, heads of the Sanhedrin. Amazing. But what about someone that missed the opportunity? Now you may have heard of Shaul Melech chasing David and Melech. Although they were both tzaddikim, Shaul had this ruach shtut that made him believe that David and Melech was trying to steal the kinghood. And he chased him and tried to kill him many times. Now, when David and Melech was running away, at one point, he arrived at the city of Nov, the city of Kohanim. But this was only after he found out that Shaul was going to try to kill him again. Where did he find out? He found out from Shaul Amelech's son, his righteous son, Yonatan. Yonatan was a very dear friend, to say the least, of David Amelech. And Yonatan warned, even though it's against his own father, against the king, he knew that his father is wrong here. David was not trying to steal anything from him. And he warned David, he told him, my father's going to try to kill you. And David ran away. And he went to the city of Nov, where the Kohanim were. Now when he got there, David told uh, Achimelech, who was the uh, head Kohen, that he's really on a special mission for Shaul and he needs some uh, food and if there's weapons for him too so Achimelech didn't think there's anything wrong with this request and he quickly gave him some food and he even gave him the sword of Goliath the one that David Melech killed many years beforehand he gave him the sword over there was Doeg Doeg Adomi the Shah Merusha Gemara says he has no share of the world to come why he saw this he was already jealous of David and he quickly went to Shaul and he told him these Kohanim they're committing treason they're going against the king by feeding your enemy and giving him weapons Shaul said go kill them he gave the permission to Doeg to go kill all the Kohanim and Doeg the Rasha went and murdered all of these Kohanim an entire city of Kohanim Now, obviously, 
Shaul made a mistake. He lost out. As a result, Hashem punished him in the war that they had of uh, the battle of uh, Gilbo. Gilboa. Shaul, Yonatan, and his other uh, two sons all died in this war. So Hashem punished Shaul. Hashem punished Yonatan. Doeg, he has no share of the world to come. He's in Gehenom and he'll never come out. But interestingly enough, we have to figure out why did Yonatan get punished here? I mean, Shaul getting punished, we understand. Doeg getting punished, we understand. Even David, to a certain extent, also got punished. We understand. But why are you not done getting punished? Says the Gemara. And one's inadvertent failure to display proper hospitality is accounted by God as a willful failure. For Rav Yehuda said in the name of Rav, if only Yonatan had escorted and meaning supplied David with two loaves of bread for his flight running away from his father, the people of Nov, the city of Kohanim, would not have been killed. Doeg, the, the Edomite, would not have been banished from the world to come, and Shaul and his three sons would not have been killed. Here we see Yonatan doing something good. He finds out that his father is about to kill David, the Tzaddik. He tells him, run! But he forgets to give him two loaves of bread. He doesn't give him two loaves of bread. For that lack of hospitality, he gets punished. Why? Look at the damage that you caused. Because you didn't give him loaves of bread, by the time he got to the city of Novi, he was starving. He had to eat something. So, to save his life, he had to make up a lie. Because he made up a lie, the entire city of Nov got murdered. Because Doeg went and told on them. Doeg himself, who until this point, had a share of the world to come. He lost his share of the world to come. You think Hashem is happy about the fact that one of his children is in Genom forever? And on top of it, Shaul decreed all of this to happen, so he also got punished. And Yonatan and his brothers also got... Why? You didn't give him two loaves of bread. Now, anyone that is not meticulous about the law will say, ah, that's too much, that's this, that's that. That's because you think God owes you something. But when a person realizes that you're in this world to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and one of the main ways that you can serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu is by perfecting yourself, perfecting your traits, then you'd realize how this is all necessary to happen in order for us to learn from the tzaddikim, from the righteous, and even from their punishments, how meticulous we need to be when it comes to things that we don't even think are a big deal. Wait, isn't it enough that I already warned him and saved his life? If you're already going to save his life, make sure you sustain his life. Give him some bread. Put some more thought into your actions. If you're already going to help somebody, don't just help them by just pointing somewhere. Give them something that's going to help them once they get to that direction, to that place. Meaning a person has to look at things from the perspective of, am I doing the best that I possibly can? Not because of any other reason other than the fact that it's my obligation to do the best that I can. Because if I cut corners, if I look to do things as quickly as possible just to get out, get it out of the way, just to make it seem like I'm doing something good. You know, arrange an event, but not put all of your efforts into inviting people and making sure that there's more people that benefit out of it. 
doing making a meal but you know doing as quick as possible just so everybody knows you cooked but not putting all your love and soul into it showing up to the shield but not really paying attention the whole time and writing down notes and really taking things into account and making sure that this is information that you're going to engrave into your mind engrave into your heart reading the book but reading it with passion reading it with zeal reading it with an intention to have this become a permanent fixture in your heart in your mind in your soul when a person puts everything into his Abu Hashem, then they can get some good results as a result, as, as an outcome of it. But when a person shortcuts here, shortcuts there, little by little they get themselves used to. Used to, it's just enough. And if they're ever in a position of power, in a position of leadership, they're going to teach this over to others. And if they don't catch themselves and they don't have a chacham to catch them, then what ends up happening is that this becomes a vicious cycle. Now, of course, Rabotai, the onus is on the leaders more than it is on the general public. Because the leaders, like the tzaddikim, that are mentioned throughout all of the gemarot, mentioned throughout the entire Tanakh, if you're in a position of leadership, that means that Kadosh Baruch Hu gave it to you. That means there's a very big responsibility that was given to you. And that means that you're going to have to either get rewarded for what you did or punished. In fact, while some of us are aware of the disaster that took place over the last few days right before Shabbat, the Palestinian terrorist murdering our fellow Jews right on Friday night on Shabbat people asking why and who and what the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin says that teachers of young children who don't perform their work honestly and corrupt Jewish judges are one of the reasons why Kadosh Baruch Hu allows their enemies to hurt us, to devour our bread, to kill us. When you have rabbis that are leaders, teachers of kids, teachers of the public, or corrupt dayanim, You have to understand that allowing this to exist is a problem for the entire nation. But a person doesn't need to go too far to find this type of stuff. Because it's literally, you could find it in many places. Not because people are making corruption everywhere on purpose. But rather because people many times have gotten accustomed to the fact of just like minimizing the truth to the point where the lie is acceptable. Knowing that half the Keila is driving on Shabbat, but no one says a thing. Knowing that the women's section is not very much different than a some uh, runway show where they barely wear any clothes, but somehow stay in business. But no one says anything. Knowing that there's trouble, but nobody rebukes. Knowing that there's issues, but nobody says anything. The only thing that people talk about is politics and their opinion about the economy. But when it comes to Abu Dhat Hashem, when it comes to the truth, very few people want to say anything. Very few leaders have the strength to do anything. Because even if they say anything, they know that they'll have to look for a new job the next day because their keila doesn't want the truth. So... Sometimes the corruption begins with good intention. But ends up corruption nonetheless. So any leader that does not want to pay the bill has to understand that if they're not able to lead with the truth, it's certainly better for them to leave. 
Why? Because you'll have to pay for everybody's crimes. And Hashem is not going to take into account that you would have gotten fired. Because He puts you on that stage with that in mind. And if a person wants to take a Kadosh Baruch Hu's Torah seriously, they'll take the Musar by the Chazonish seriously also. And not mislead the community or mislead themselves to think that it's okay. Now sometimes, this is the type of information that you can find in the book, like we see here. But sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes the rabbi just reads it, but doesn't have it ingrained into their heart. Sometimes they'll hear somebody else doing something and still what they read is not enough. This is the reason why having a connection to a chacham, having a connection, a real connection to your rabbi, to your chacham is critical because your rabbi is going to tell you the truth if he's really your rabbi. But if he's just your friend that you bought, he's not going to tell you the friend. He's not going to tell you the truth. On the other hand, if a person is a regular Balabite that was brought up in religious house and what he sees, what he saw growing up is what he does. And to him, developing himself any further seems to be impossible. The Chazonish also takes this into account. He knows the weakness of people. And he says all of this is being said from the point of view of Allah. The study of character traits and the obligation of mitzvah observance and purity of devotion. But when speaking of an individual who was brought up with this way of thinking since childhood and who cannot see things differently, this is he's talking about the old timers, people that are already 70, 80 years old. They can't even think as far as developing themselves at this stage. They saw this, they have the old-fashioned way, so for them to become more particular about the details and so on, it seems almost like an impossibility for them. He wants to give them hope. What's their hope? He saw this since childhood and he cannot see things differently. It's right to consider them as if they're forced into it. One whose intentional deeds are considered to be mere errors. And he is therefore worthy of love and respect for all the good that he has within him being devoted to Torah and Jewish belief, raising his sons to Torah and many more positive attributes that he possesses. So here he's telling us that some of the old timers that you have in your community, they're 70, 80 years old, and you're going to tell them, listen, you have to start learning Musar every day, changing your behavior, not being so angry, not being so, so stingy, not being so impatient and so on. Don't focus on them so much. Why? To them, for them to change at 70 years old, it's, it's a near impossibility. Work on the younger generation. Work on the people that are still in their you know, teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s. They're still developing themselves. Work on them. Don't focus so much on the people that literally are from the older generation where they don't really know anything different. Now, how can we judge those people unfavorably? Look at their kids. If they were from enough that they allowed their kids to grow up religious with Torah with mitzvot that's already good that's already good that already deserves respect that already deserves respect in fact the Gemara says that you'll see that at times it says that there are certain people that were very wicked Gemara Perik Chelek talks about how there are certain people that were very wicked have no share of the world to come whether it's uh, Bilam Dwey Gadomi uh, but yet you see that there are certain people like Ahaz that also made a lot of sins, but uh, it doesn't say that they don't have a share of the world to come. So the Gemara says, how come Ahaz is not mentioned as one of the kings that didn't have a share of the world to come? It says because Ahaz is in between two tzaddikim. His father was a tzaddik and his son was a tzaddik. So what's the difference? But Menashe's father also was a tzaddik. Who is by Chizkiyahu, who also is a Achaz's son. So, how come that didn't work? 
So the Gemara explains that the father, the father is a tzaddik, not because of the son. And therefore, the merits of the father cannot help protect the son. On the other hand, the son is most definitely the product of the father. It's very uncommon for a wicked father to have a completely righteous kid. Although it does happen, every rule has an exception. But generally speaking, wicked people typically do not have righteous kids. So the son's merits do go to the father also because it's due to his father. But then the Sefer Hasidim says, and the Marsha as well, yeah, but there are exceptions. What about those exceptions where the kid is righteous, but the father is wicked? Those are also explainable by the same logic. Why? The merits still go to the father. Why? Because if the kid is righteous, certainly there's righteousness in that father. Certainly there's righteousness in that mother. Even if they didn't exemplify that righteousness in their own behavior, they had enough righteousness to teach their kid the right direction. Even if they didn't teach him Torah, they allowed him to learn Torah. Even if they didn't practice Torah, they didn't go against it. And they supported it if possible. That in itself shows that their true inner intention was good. They just simply submitted to the Yetzirah instead of the Yetzirah Tov. So that, that's why the righteousness of the son always goes to the parents. But on the other hand, the righteousness of the father doesn't necessarily go to the son. Why? Because typically the son is not going to, uh, the father is not going to become righteous because of the son. Although again, even those have exceptions. The point we see here is that we have many people that we can help in our communities today. Many times you'll see that there are special programs for the elders, the Holocaust survivors, the people that are already in their prime. The truth is that although certainly there's programs that are necessary for everybody, the main focus needs to shift from the older generation to some of the younger generation. Not because the older generation is not important, but because the older generation is less, it's not less possible to change them. There's less development possible in that case. Whereas the younger one, it's not too late. You can still help them. Now, of course, many people will disagree. And one of the reasons is because the older generation usually has a lot more money. Now, if a person wants to teach the truth to everybody, that's the best. Young, old, male, female, by all means. The truth is, uh, is, is something that everybody needs. But if there is a community that has specific programs and you have to make a choice, either making a uh, program for the senior citizens or making a program for some of the uh, newlyweds, certainly it's better to make a program for the newlyweds. Why? Because that's the future and that's also a, uh, uh, an age group that typically is much easier and much more likely to change as a result of hearing the truth than somebody that's already in their 70s and, and 80s. Now, if you're worried about money, remember about the analogy that the Chavot Levavot said at the beginning of this year. If you're destined to have that clear, sweet water, it's going to come. If not, there's nothing you can do about it anyway. Whether you have an old, old people class or you have a young people class. Last but not least, we want to see an example, a real-life example, in someone that worked on their character traits to such an extent that you see this in their life, in their life choices. story I heard from Rav Ephraim and, uh, today, and uh, it's a story by a very famous Rav, uh, Rav uh, Yosef ben Porat. Shichye, he is an extraordinary Talmud Chacham, very interesting lectures, I don't think there's anybody on earth that knows more about the Holocaust and the details from both a Torah perspective and a historical perspective than he does. He has a lot of really interesting lectures, very highly recommended. Anyway, Rav uh, Yosef ben Porat was uh, around Talmidei Chachamim in Gdolei Ador for generations already. 
And he said one time in a story that um, he was uh, close to Rabbi Yashif. Multiple times he went on specific missions for him. And when the time came for uh, Rabbi Yosef ben Parat to uh, wed off his, his son, he asked Rav Yashiv for a personal favor if he could be the Mesader Kiddushim, to do the Chupa Kiddushim. And of course, Rav Yashiv that felt he owed Rav Yosef ben Parat a Karatatov, because, you know, he obviously has, has been a, uh, you know, good to him also and uh, has done what he asked him to do. He said, sure, tell me where and when. And I'll be there. Now, Yosef ben Porat says, after he said yes, I thought about it. And then I realized, what am I doing? What do I need this for? I'm going to take the Torah of one of the G'dolei Adol and waste it? Throw it out? For what? For him to be in a few pictures with my son and the wedding so people can see that I'm close to Rav Yashiv and he even did the chupa for my son. For that I'm going to waste all of this Torah. Immediately he realized what a mistake I made. And he went and he drove all the way to Rav Yashiv. And he told him, Kvodah Rav, I'm sorry, but you don't need to come to the wedding. I'm sorry for even asking you. I don't want to waste your time it's better that the Rav learn Torah Rav Yashif says are you sure is everything okay with the wedding he says no 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 everything is absolutely good I just I know that the Rav's Torah is much more valuable than him doing it's uh, that's just for uh for show it's not it's not necessary anybody else can do we need the Torah of the Rav much more than we need the Rav to do immediately Rav Yashif had a big smile on his face. He was so happy. He immediately called his goodbye. Come, come, come. He says, yeah, Rabbi Yosef ben Porat, anything he asks, anytime he calls, immediately you get me. Anything he asks, you give it to him. Because I owe him a big akarata tov. So the goodbye asked, why, Kvodav? What do you do? He says, he let me go. He is allowing me to learn Torah. He's allowing me to learn Torah. So from here we learn a few things. Number one, we learn how much Arab al Yashiv loved the Torah, but the same token, how much he loved Am Yisrael, that he was l- willing, willing to put his Torah on the side for a little bit just because he knew that to give chizuk to one of the people that's loyal to the Torah, to one of the people that's loyal to Akadosh Baruch Hu, it's worth it. But as soon as you let me off the hook and I can learn more Torah, Baruch Hashem, it's the greatest thing in the world, but even more so. We see how Arab Yosef ben Porat didn't just teach Musa, teach Alakha, teach us to do all the things we need to do in order to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu. He also applied that lesson to himself in a very difficult decision. A decision that most people simply couldn't bring themselves to make. You can have one of the Gdolei Ador, Arab El Yashiv, to do the Chupai and Kiddushin for your kid? Who wouldn't want that? Only someone that appreciates that Gadol's Torah more than they appreciate the pictures that they'll have on the wall. If you truly appreciate that Gadol, you pre- truly appreciate that Chacham, you're going to do everything you can to allow him to learn because you know you're going to need to learn from him much more than you're going to need to put a picture of him on your wall. Yiratzon. That we truly appreciate the Chachamim enough to ask them the most meaningful questions so we can lead our communities, our nation, and ourselves in the right direction, in the direction of Emet. Because that's the trait that's needed most in this generation. Amen v'amen.